It is the Royal Blue Podcast. It is the Post Burnley Show. And what a four in a row show it's going to be today. Do you like that, lads? Oh, very, very. <laughs> I'm your host, Ian Kroll. And today I'm joined by the Echoes Ever NFC correspondent, home and away, Joel Thomas. Joe, how are we? Yeah, very good, thank you. Good, good, good. And we've also got Liverpool Echo Sports reporters, Conor O'Neill and Matt Jones. Lads, how's it going? All good. Matt? Very good, mate. Very good. Good, good, good. So on the agenda today, then, it's obviously all talk about Burnley. The reaction and post-match reaction of the Burnley 2-0 win. We've also got a full and preview, massive, massive quarter-final at Goodison Park under the lights Tuesday night. So, Joe, I'll come to you first because you were there at Turf Moor. Just tell us exactly what it was like. It was lovely. <laughs> it was just it was just lovely. It was easy. I think it was just, in some ways, it was almost... Um, Almost a bit of an anticlimax. All the other, all the other wins recently have had a bit of jeopardy in the forest. Was you know, were quite sure which way it was going to go. Chelsea started the second half right, just at nil nil. Newcastle took a little bit of time. Burnley, I was kind of there expecting, expecting them to show a bit of fight. Um, I thought it was a must-win game for them. You know, especially with Forest having lost um, earlier in the weekend, with Everton being a team that could potentially still be in there all a bit because of the potential uh, the point deduction. Um, and obviously, we know that Everton had you know injury and suspension crisis. This was one of the more um, intriguing lineups selected by Sean Dyche. Obviously, he had his hands tied with a lot of them. Um, so I thought there was potentially quite a lot that could go wrong at Turf Moor. And you know, last time we went there in April of um, of last year, it was a, a very difficult time. This couldn't have been any easier. It was nice, and we spoke about this a little bit last week. But it's, Everton just seemed to be in as a club seems to be in the habit of winning. And I think that what Saturday kind of suggested is that even when you change the personnel, it's obviously that it's obviously that attitude has been distilled throughout the squad and not just the, the 11, 12, 13 that were on the pitches for the three games prior to that. You look at the performances of Ben Godfrey, Michael Keane, and you, know, you, you can see that they know how to win all of a sudden. And I think they like it. And I like watching it and I like writing about it and talking about it to you. <laughs> So I keep it going. I can't complain. Okay. I mean, <laughs> no complaints. I mean, Matt, on um, on Friday, I did the, the preview podcast with uh, Chris Beasley and Paul Wheelock, and we kind of suggested that we knew exactly how Burnley were going to play because it's how Winston Company wants to play, but they, they did it badly and Everton took advantage of that once again. Yeah, 100%, mate. And I think as soon as Everton go 2 0 up, and but you don't actually ever want to say it out loud, but I think in your head, you're thinking this game's over and done with. Um, because you could see that after that initial flurry uh, from Burnley, I think they looked like they might cause us a few problems as soon as Everton settled down into that new shape. Um, the players seemed to you know, develop a few like early little links um, and realise how they're going to get through this game. It was only ever going to be Everton's football match. Um, just to echo what Joe said, really, it was just so easy, wasn't it? And like that second half, it, 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 it almost felt like with the call rate coming off, like I feel like I feel like if that game was in the balance, maybe we don't see him. Come out in the second half there. I don't know how severe his injury is, really. I mean, maybe he felt like Tuesday was in mind. And yeah, like the, the second half, as much as they probably had, what, like 70% of the ball in, in the second half, you'd say? Like it, it wasn't a 70% against us where you felt like we were stretched at any point. You know, I think back to games this season. And the one that comes to mind was, was Brighton, where it felt like we were able to like work quite hard to, to shut them down. They looked quite, quite threatening when they had loads of the ball. That on, on Saturday, it was very stabbing in possession, wasn't it, from Burnley? It didn't really feel like Everton. Everton's defenders' legs would have been aching or they would have been out of breath, really. They were in the shape, they were comfortable, and they, and they just shut it down. So, yeah, just delighted. And, you know, it's it's, it's mad sort of sitting here and, you know, we were speaking about it before, kind of where we're like, oh, we're all sort of expecting Everton to win these away games now. And you go back, you know, six months, nine months, and you think, do you remember how hard away games used to feel? And you'd look at an away game on the calendar and think, oh. I remember going to... Norwich a couple of years ago I think they'd lost eight in a row with well, well scoring and you look at that game on the calendar and you go oh we're going to lose there that, 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 that's, just, that's just what Everton do and we went there and we did lost and we sort of fulfilled that that sort of role that we always tend to, to fulfill and to was it four wins in a row away from home now you know we've got the got one of the best away records in the league we've lost to the best home team in the country in Aston Villa and the second best in Liverpool you know this is you know this is something we we sort of are taking for granted now, but maybe we shouldn't take for granted because this team and this manager really managed to change perceptions away from home. And since since the deduction and since the end of last season, they've all done absolutely amazingly well. Absolutely. 
Corey, I'm just going to read this off my notes, but the last time Everton visited Turf Moor, obviously the then Burnley manager, Sean Dyche, suggested that um, the Blues had lost the ability to win. This certainly, uh, well, this this team now under Sean Dyche knows how to win football matches, don't they? I don't think he was wrong when he said that either. No, I, don't <laughs> think he was wrong. I don't think he was wrong when he said that back in April 2022. But, I mean, like Matt says, and just the stark contrast, I think, from not just then to where Sean Dyche inherited and, you know, where the team he beat, walked into in January of this year to where they are now is, is, is incredible really because you know there's, there has been changes but there hasn't been that many changes you know you think of Wright McNeil January couldn't get a look in now he's probably one of Everett's most important players you know Jared Brownfield's obviously come in but didn't play the weekend but Michael Keane who I think we've all safe for safe we struggled to start this season mm-hmm. come in and done really well Ben Godfrey's come in and done really well on, on Saturday and it's just it, it's down to Sean Dyche there's no other way to look at it than it's down to Sean Dyche because He's set them up. He's got the, you know, the mentality, the togetherness. You know, it's been it, the, the closest thing you can describe it is probably very similar to when David Moyes was in charge. In that terms of like, you go and watch it, an Everton team. And okay, it's not maybe going to be spectacular in terms of the football you see, but it's sweat on the shirt. It's people doing what they're being asked to do. Mm-hmm. It's everyone being organised, everyone being together, everyone battling hard, and the fans can really get behind it. And that's the most important thing because I think over time. The fans have very little to get behind in terms of what they've seen on the pitch. It's been more of a case of, you think of the two seasons haven't stayed up, the fans dragged over the line on personal pride because no one wants to be part of it. It's a football club. What because of that? Because of what they've seen on the football pitches, there's motivation. There's a total opposite now. And you look at you look at Saturday. I mean, I think the second half, Everton fans just spent the whole half signals and because I think they literally, you know, they knew that unless something might happened or less Everton, you know basically threw the game away then they would have come away with another three points and it's all down to Sean Dyche and what a job he's doing in a short space of time and I have to say I think I have my doubts at the start of the season I think with Sean Dyche I think it didn't start great did it I think you know the Fulham game the Wolves games at home Villa away you started to think oh is this maybe a bit too big for him is he not, is he not? but he's really got a stranglehold of the, of the football club really and he's transformed them, and now you look at where they are and you know the, the position the table isn't great but no one's looking nervous over the shoulder everyone's looking up and thinking you know there's no reason why they can't be in the top half moving forward since the second half of the season yeah absolutely and Joe uh, just to the uh, couple of touching points on the match then Tom McCabalou would have a, had a golden opportunity with a header about 17 minutes in but didn't really matter did it because upset Anana from the corner with a, a fantastic header and obviously the goal there is second against Burnley in about six weeks six weeks but it just proves how important he, he is to that team coming back in after injury. He is. I mean, obviously, he's part of that collection of four centre midfielders that they've got for the free spaces. And, you know, if it went out, we're starting to see they're all rotating pretty well. So if somebody does come out like Idrissa Gay came out, um, you're part way through the Chelsea match, and now they can step in and they all know their jobs. And even when they're being asked to do slightly different roles, because, you know, DeCorey's been asked to do different roles to, in that centre midfield in recent weeks because of of some of the other injuries and, 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 and suspensions, and it's clear that they all, all all know their game plan. And you're right, like, I mean, how often would we have seen a Dominic Calvert Lewin header like that? You know, good save, but I thought he should have scored. And, you know, we spent the first, you know, six weeks of this season saying how costly misses like that were. Well, this time around, the next ball that goes into the box, it's, you know, it's in the back of the net. And it was quite satisfying, you know, just that little passage of play for a couple of reasons. One, I think it was Nathan Patterson who put the cross in for. Dominic Calvert-Lewin, you know, he had to get a start against Burnley because Col- Coleman and Young are injured. But, you know, I've said it a lot in here, but I still think Patterson deserves a little bit of a chance. And, you know, one of the things I've been saying last week was he was going to get a chance on Saturday. If he takes it, I hope he gets to keep it and gets a run in the team, hopefully. And it's an easy one to start him against Fulham because, again, you know, Coleman and Young are still coming back from injury. So, you know, I hope he gets given an opportunity to had another decent enough game. And as for the Inanna goal, again, we've already mentioned the last trip to, to Burnley. And you know, haven't got done so <laughs> quite up in twice in that game by deep in swinging corners to the back post. Um, you know, Sean Dyche's favourite. We've seen that blueprint used so many times at Everton in the, the 11 months, 12 months that he's been there now. It's just nice to see it work in the opposite direction. Yeah, there it was, Dwight McNeil to the back post. And as an Everton lad that's heading it in instead, it was. It was it was really really satisfying for Lan for for you know, for a number of reasons and um, yeah I think obviously the second goal came from a set piece as well I think Everton scored more goals from set pieces now than than any other team in the Premier League and 
how big a criticism was that from all of us under Frank Lampard and just previously it just felt like such an avenue that was being underexploited given the strength of the uh, the aerial presence in that Evans side and some of the players that, could, that we could have been attacking the ball you know it's just he's dragging Everton forward but so much of it is just by simple wins just making sure that you know set pieces are being taken by the right players and they go into an area where the right players are tackling him in the box and you know you just uh, how many, how many Edis Tarkovsky wins in the opposition box or running around from set pieces? It's just phenomenal. Like, it just muscles his way up there. It's brilliant. He mentioned um, Deitch's comments after that game when he was the only boss for Everton, not knowing how to win. I asked him about that on, on Friday. It's funny, whenever you ask him about that, he's always like, oh, it's all misinterpreted. It's all been mis- <laughs> misreported. I didn't mean it like that. I spoke to Frank after. and I, 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 I looked at it before I went and I looked at it after and I was like, don't know how anyone is how you could accuse anyone of misreport. It's pretty clear what he said and what he meant. And it's even more bizarre that he royals at it because I mean he like Connor said he was right. Yeah. Like they had for yeah. to win and now he's got know, a psychological edge or whatever and obviously at the time. Well he still does, doesn't he? The police do it from now. Like yeah. he's, he's one step out of the club, isn't he? And it's working in the Belize's favour at the minute and you know, as a result we're four lads smiling here on a Monday morning, aren't we? I think that's the big thing, is that it's a team that plays with strengths yeah. mm. because when you look at like the power, the, the the height and power they've got in the in the ranks, but the core, eh? Onara, the centre backs. Why wouldn't you just put the ball in the six yard box and to attack? Like, and you think of like sitting under Frank Lampard, where we play short corners, and you think, well, what's the point in that? You know, the, the, literally put put the ball in the box and let people attack it. Now, under Sean Dyche, it people might look at it think it's simple. It's, it's you know, it's, it's effect, but it's it's effective football. You know. If you've got if you've got if you've got big strong lads, put the ball in the box and let them attack the ball. It's, it's not it's not it's not difficult. It's one of them as well. Like you, you sort of look at like I think Joe said there about Tarkovsky and like you know, like he sort of he sort of like muscles his way to the ball. Whereas like you look at like Anana and Carlo Lewin and they like they like run and leap, don't they? It's like, yeah. There's like different ways in which those players attack the ball as well, which must be like really hard to defend. But like on Anana in particular, like you were saying there, I mean, like. We sh- he should do this loads more, shouldn't he? Really, like, because mm-hmm. he he can't. He is obviously a big lad. He can't really spring. You know, I remember early on in his career when um, at Everton, he was at Southampton away. Southampton, and he, got, he gets up and heads so, for Cody, doesn't yeah, he? And it's like it's an amazing leap. And like, and I think that's where you, you go back there. And I think that's where those comparisons with him and Fellaini sort of started, which obviously haven't really turned out to be to be anything. Um, because they're very, very different players, but it feels like he gets there quite a lot, and then his head is like terrible at the end, <laughs> like it goes over the bar or whatever. But you know, he, he's got all the attributes there to be. You know, he's not going to score ten goals a season, but you know, what's he got now? Two. Like he, he, he should be getting five, I think, from set pieces alone because the delivery for McNeil or Glana tends to be really good. We've got other options in there as well. You can take players away from him, and and, and he should be able to exploit that a bit better. I think because he, he's got all the tools there to do it. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Connor Joe touched upon Patterson there. Um, after about 24 minutes, I was watching the match with a friend and I said to him, he's taking... No, no, I thought he's taking his chance here. So did he take his chance? Yeah, I thought he'd done really, really well. I, I saw it was quite critical of him when he got his, his last chance at West Ham United um, to the dismay of many. I think it's safe to say. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I thought he done really, really well. And but I think he's I think that way the plays on Saturday suits him a lot more than being a natural full back. Okay. I think he's more accustomed to playing a right wing back role than he is. So he's got that little bit of right back. I think you look at the the, the chance for Carl Butler yeah. is the perfect example of a kind of a right wing back and able to get forward, pick a cross. And I think he's helped by the, the cover that he then has defensively in the three centre backs, rather than having to be in a four and perhaps having to be a little bit more defensively given the lack of numbers. But I thought he'd done really, really well and I'm a, I'm a Joe now. I think you've got to give him an extended run in the team. I think you've got to give him a chance to, to nail down the position because, you know, the beauty of Everton is they've got some really good young players. And, like, you know, a lot of me, like Tarkovsky and Pickford and the you know, kinds of people who've been there for a while. But, you know, you think of James Garner, Onana, Brown Foyt when he comes back in, Calvert Lewin. They've got some, you know, Jack McNeil. They've got some really young, promising players. Yeah, yeah. And there's no reason why I don't think Nathan Patterson can't become one of them young, promising players. But I do think he must be benefits more from that ring, right wing back role than actually being right back. Okay, so it must, my, Michael Keane obviously came back into the team, and yeah. I, I feel like I need to apologise to him because I was a little bit critical of him on the <laughs> and in the Friday part. But you know, as as people have been in the past, um, but after thirty years, Michael Keane has clearly found his position as a centre forward, <laughs> coach one striker. Uh, I think we've known this for a while, haven't we? You know, there's, there's been a few different. I mean, Joe will be able to say better than me, but I feel like we've got a few different managers coming and say, 
then I'll flip and like, oh, he's the best finisher at the football club. Yeah. Like, but the first, the first shot's brilliant. It's, yeah, like, it's, bal- yeah, it's a bouncing ball first time. And like, you, the technique to it, it's absolutely fantastic. And then obviously it keeps us cool for, for the second one. But, but yeah, no, do you know what? I think it was really smart management actually going to the back five mm-hmm. because you've probably got a situation there where if, you know, Mikolenko out, you could have easily gone Godfrey left back on you and just stuck with the back four. But I think then you've got a situation where Keane, if he would have played on the right hand side of the defence, would have been maybe more exposed because, like Connor said, Patterson likes to, to get forward more. And then on the other side, you've got a non left back play next to Tarkovsky. It, it all feels a little bit uncomfortable. But I think by just giving Keane the protection of playing in the middle of the back three with Tarkovsky to the left and Godfrey to the right makes him feel a bit more comfortable. And then Godfrey and Turner's then got that protection either side of him as well. So I think both centre backs who came in would have felt a lot better. And I, I think middle of a back three, that, that feels like. The ideal Michael yeah. the position does yeah, you know so, you don't you don't really want to fall back steaming on and leaving space outside and you know playing there you can just sit in the middle see how everyone's going read the game and just head and kick everything away and listen it was, it was great for him I think but you know whatever we say about him as a player I mean it's been critical in the past he always comes out in front of us and he always speaks to the press he's, he's very honest you know Joe's piece from from the weekend was speaking about how, how great he was behind the scenes with, with fans and stuff like that I think. I, I can't imagine, even though he's not been playing, he would have been anything other than absolutely fine having a round for the group and, and working hard. And, you know, even in his, his comments after the game, he's spoken about how good Jared Proudwood's been doing. So, so yeah, it, good, good to see him come in and do well. And, and maybe him coming in and doing well gives Dice a bit of flexibility in terms of formation now going forward. You know, we used that, that back three formation really well in Villa. We've not seen it again since the weekend, was it? And that's the first time we've seen it again. Um, and maybe something with um, just again maybe going to Afcon as well. We're going to lose a midfielder there. Might be somebody to look at in January. And Key has just given something a little bit more to think about. But but just just please, on Michael Key. I, I don't know if it really necessarily means anything massive going forward or long term or changes his prospects and everything. But just nice for him to get a, a game and get his moment. I think oh, yeah. the, the big thing you, you could tell Cunha is that <coughs> the two of them have asked too clearly hasn't dropped in training. Yeah. Because normally if a player hasn't played for a long time and they come in, it looks like they need time to come in or they start going down with cramp after an hour. Them two didn't seem to be in, in that. It's clear that they, they've obviously the heads not dropped to trade and they'd be working as hard as anyone and they're reaping the benefits. And, and whatever Sean Dyche is doing behind the scenes, clearly working because there seems to be an acceptance that people, when they come in and get the chance, they, they tend to take it. Don't they? You look at this season, you know, Jack, James Garner come in, didn't even took his chance and hasn't looked back. Brownford come in and took his chance and hasn't looked back. Whatever comes in tends to give Sean Dyche something to think about. Unless you are a Dan Juma who seemingly didn't take his chance. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen him since. Well, it's really good what you're saying about, about Keane. I saw a piece yesterday just saying in a couple of weeks ago, just before the Man United game, I've sat down talking to James Tarkovsky and you know, it was the international break at the time and most of the conversation was him and Brian Foyt. You know, what, what's Brian Foyt's possible to like to play with? You two of them knock on the door for England. I mean, mm. there's, there's a partnership. I mean, there's probably the best one going at, at, at the moment. But it was quite notable that even... In that conversation, he used the as an opportunity to flip back to Keane and, and Godfrey and everything that they were doing behind the scenes. And, you know, guilty of this myself, didn't think too much of it at the time because then you kind of think, well, you know, he's a standing captain. He's not going to turn up even and say, oh, so and so isn't pulling their way or so and so sulking. You know, sometimes it feels like these are easy things for people to say. But obviously, a couple of weeks later, you know, Godfrey and, and, and Keane have come in and they've, they've Vindicated everything that Tarkovsky was saying because you can't play like that unless you're still taking everything seriously and be professional and being mature and taking your responsibility behind the scenes. That's what they clearly did. Michael Keane did have crap after that, by the way, but he uh, <laughs> didn't show it. Yeah, but, but he, 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 he felt he forced his way through the last half an hour as a speaking, testament to the Testament to the Well, I think, it's a, to be yeah. honest, I think it's probably a testament to how good Everton were in the first 25 yeah. minutes and how much the game was won by that point because he was saying by that stage he could just. Became just about focus on making sure he was in the right place at the right time, so he didn't have to you know, do much recovery work. And uh, didn't, you know, obviously we did, we we couldn't tell, could we? So I mean, it shows he, he knew what he was doing. We're in danger of turning this podcast into a Michael Key loving, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he deserves it. He, oh, he deserves it. Well, he scored it again, didn't he? As well, the second half at the post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. 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 His highlights for you. He throw in that Tottenham goal. He yeah. found the Palace goal. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah. There's some there's some corkers in there, isn't there? No, yeah. Absolutely. He threw his assist for Mina against Wolves to stop his style last season. Yeah. Liverpool as well, hasn't he, in the past? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wanted the cop was yeah. one, yeah. 
Oh, you got so which stand? <laughs> <laughs> which I think. <laughs> It well, should be called a Michael, but Michael Keane Arena. <laughs> <laughs> to another goal scorer then, Joe. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Carbert Lewin, obviously, we're, we're desperate for him to, to get back on that goal train. But yeah. it's nice to see the goals being spread around the team once again. Yeah, but, you know, like we've said many times on here before, you know, the way in which this Everton side sets up, it doesn't need its front man to be prolific. You know, Dominic Calvert Lewin's role isn't, I mean, we all want him to score 15, 20 goals a season. And we know that he's capable of doing that. But more important for, for Everton, because we we saw this in how much he struggled in his absence last year, it's having the figurehead, having the focal point that makes the rest of the system work. And the reality is that you know, you can be critical and say Dominic Cavill hasn't scored in this many games, hasn't scored as many goals as we'd like. But the reality is you know, Dwight McNeil's popped up with goals recently. And Philip decorey has got six. You know, Jack Harrison's got a few useful assists. Even Andrissa Gates popped up with a goal. A lot of that's happening because of what Dominic Calvert Loon is doing in front of them. You know, and you almost a bigger part of his role. Uh, but that's why Beto is such a good foil. So they're you know, slightly different type of players, but they do a similar job in that. But scoring goals is only one part of, they, of their role and responsibility in that team. Another big part is creating the conditions for everybody around them to score and provide more goals. At the minute, Dominic Albaloon is doing a very, very good job at that. We've liked him to have scored his header. Of course, we would have done. Um, and yeah, we, we all want him to see. I think we all we, we can all see how hard he's worked to get back to this, this situation. We can all see how valuable he is at Evans' side. I think we'd all like him to make a, an obvious push for the England squad for, for the upcoming Euros. You know, that, that'd be nice. And I think he's... Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm to stay well away from it, to be honest. <laughs> fair, enough. Fair, fair enough. But yeah. like, you know, he's someone who's... Opportunities for his country yeah. have been limited mainly by his body. Not his yeah, I know ability. he if he plays well. He's going to be in the conversation. He, exactly, and I think to get in that conversation, you don't need to score goals yeah, because it's, things are a little bit more superficial. But um, but I got no problems with not in the back of that no. at the minute. Like I thought, you know, you saw it right at the end of the first half, and obviously two 0 up, and you know, going to stoppage time, and there he was, you know, winning throw-ins and corners deep in Burnley territory because he was just fighting until the whistle went just to. Keep better and competitive, so like I think he's doing a great job. If not, it, it, sorry, I was just gonna say, like it, it feels to me like it, like it, he was really involved in both the celebrations for the goals, wasn't yeah. he? Well, like he's, he's over giving it loads to the fans, and like he's, he's made up. And like I, I imagine for him, like obviously he will want to score goals, but like it feels a bit like for him, like after just missing so much footy, it's just like he's just enjoying playing and being on the pitch again. Yeah. Like, and, and like I think in the past, maybe he's not been someone who's like been fully invested in all like, you know, the giving it loose the away end and stuff like that. But now he, he is and like, it, that, that's just good to see in itself. And you think back to when he came into the side, like he, he scored his first goal of the season at Brentford, didn't he, off the bench? Mm. And he's basically been barring a couple of games that started or been, been, you know, in the squad since then. And I sort of like think back over the season, I think like when did this all really start to turn around for the better? And it's about that, isn't it? It's mm. not Brentford. And I, don't, I don't think it's any coincidence that and maybe he's not been scoring the goals, but our form in the period where he's been starting matches is miles better than than when he wasn't. And yeah. it, 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 this is you think you think Carvalho, and I think people maybe look back at that season under Angelotti where he had his best goal scoring year, and he, he's never going to be that player in, in this setup because obviously the style is massively different. But he hasn't he hasn't got the players around him to be able to just be that penalty box striker yeah. anymore. You know, Luca Dean, Richarlison. Rodriguez, Sigurdsson, you think about that, that those four players and the supply line they gave him in that team, he could just play between the whip of the goalpost and just have everything in because the creative supply was so good. Like we haven't got that anymore. Like he's he's got to run the channels a bit more. He's got to you know do more for the team. He's got to be more like the Carvel Lewin who was so good on the Marco Silva, but he didn't score as many goals because the style has changed completely. So I'm not surprised he's he's not scoring as frequently, but he just looks like he's made up to be back on the footy pitch again and. Um, you know, based on the celebrations and based on the way he acted on the pitch on Saturday, like it doesn't really seem to be bothering him too much either at the moment. Yeah. I think the big thing as well when you talk about England is that there's long been a belief, hasn't he, that Gareth Southgate does seem as the second choice to Harry Kane. And I think even the World Cup last year, I think it was quite late when Gareth Southgate made the call that he wasn't going to take him, and that was only because he got injured. It was it Leicester and he couldn't pull yeah. up, didn't he? A, a pretty much, but I think up until then, Southgate was pretty torn on whether to take him or not, which shows, given he hasn't played much football, how highly he regards him. When you think of the the forwards in the round, what have been in the round England in the last couple of years behind Harry Kane, mm. 
none of them probably have been given the chances that Dominic Calvert Lewin has when he's been fit and, and probably none of them are seen as a natural successor to Kane if he's not available than, than Calvert Lewin is. So I think mean, that's a big compliment as well because when you think now there's been obviously a lot of players, but Calvert Lewin's still right there in the thinking. Matt, I'll just come back to you on this one then. So does this dispel the, the myth that possession wins football matches? All, all eight of Everton's Premier League wins have been while having less than 50% possession. Oh, yeah, I think, I think you've done that. Yeah, a long time ago, we dice. Um, but yeah, like it's mad, isn't it? Like, because it's this like, it's just like constant like thing going on your head. Like when you see us have like none of the ball in the second half, you're like, well, like you're like we're fine here, but you're also like a little bit nervous still, just because you know it, it's your team. But but yeah, like it, it it just suits us, doesn't it? Completely down to the ground. I think the, the way the way we soak up pressure, the shape of the team, and then you know you think back to the games against Newcastle and Chelsea in particular, and. Like it, it, it's not like it's not that like we're just sat in all the time. Like I think I think ironically, the game at the weekend. If you if, you're, if you think of the idea you had of Dice before he came to Everton and what he was like at Burnley, I think that second half of the weekend is most aligned with that version. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense in the terms of like sitting back, everyone behind the ball, edge your own penalty area, and just just wait and play set pieces. Like ironically, the most you know Dicean performance we've had in the Verde Commons was away at Burnley. <laughs> But I think other than that, we've not we've not really done that. Like obviously we haven't had as much of the ball, but we d- we don't really sit on the edge of our own box, do we? You, know, you think about Chelsea and and um, and Newcastle and the goals come from us against Newcastle being high up and forcing Trippier into mistakes, turn it over quickly and scoring. Chelsea, it's the same. We win the ball back, fast transition from McNeil, and, and we we break through and score. So it's not like it's not like we're being passive in games and just sort of being negative and waiting for the, the football match to, to kind of come to us. Um, I, I just think. Saturday was just a bit more like that because we were so confident the, the game was one of our time and maybe the mind did start to think to to the heavy schedule we've got and, and, the, and the Carabao Cup game as well and we just thought everyone's going to sit here and just, and just conserve energy so yeah I, that, you know right now as much as the ball but I certainly don't think we're being negative in the way we're playing I think it's being it's being smart it's being aggressive at the right times I mean I'm not going to probably endear myself to the football hipsters who, who like a stat but who honestly cares no I mean, I mean, there's only one stat that matters in yeah, life and, 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 and I think <laughs> <laughs> maybe an 80s football hipster but I think the biggest thing and Everton fans always more is that the one thing that does matter is results isn't it because yeah. you look at you know last few seasons I think we all can all Frank Lampard come in and try to play a nice brand of football and nice style it nearly took Everton to the championship because he didn't get any results what Sean Dyche is doing is playing to his side strengths and I think if we'll be honest, there's probably times where we don't want our teams off the ball as much as what people probably want them to. Because yeah. would you want to see a dressing gown again in the corner trying to play from a 10 yard pass to each other in the middle of the pitch? I, I don't think I would. So, yeah, I think it's just a case he's it's actually just playing to his strengths. And if that means they don't have the ball as often as we've got position, then so be it. Because it, it's, it's the other results that's the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe, just want a special mention on this. There was there was a, a point in you know the first half just before the, the half time whistle went that Burnley did get in. Mm-hmm. Uh, behind our defence but Ben Godfrey was there to save the day what an outstanding well challenge block whatever you want to call it interception it was yeah the clearance and yeah. to get there obviously Zaki Amdini was yards out and had an open goal facing him and you know yeah, Burnley get that goal back all of a sudden the second half's a very very different game yeah. Um, yeah it was a we know his talents are we know we've got superb strength and, and, and pace and um, you know we put that on show there I mean probably what question mark is the way he had to work so hard to recover to be in that position in the first place, but you know, and when you've got pace like that, like, I mean, you did, I've seen screen grabs of it and the ball's coming into the box, and yeah, you know, Godfrey isn't even in the picture, so but then to make it back and then to get it away from goal, bearing in mind he's going with that pace, that momentum in the middle of the goal, a couple of yards out, yeah, it was phenomenal. And obviously, you know, it was celebrated like a goal, and he, you know, he deserves great credit for it because it, it, it made everything so much easier in that second half. Just sticking with you then, just a little bit of injury news. I don't know whether you can update us, but Decore obviously came off for Dobbin. Was that precaution? Or are we expecting him to be not fit for it? Uh, Decore is touch and go for, 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 for Tuesday. Um, he, he had a tight hamstring, so I think it was very much a precautionary one. I think Deitch looked at the situation and thought, I probably got the liberty to, to take him off and just protect him. So we know hamstrings can develop in something a lot more serious than Decore is, if not the most important and problem one of the most important cogs in that setup for how it works and how Everton can can get forward. Um so if you're gonna protect anyone you protect him and you do when you two lap at Burnley. Okay. Um Connor, you know, 
obviously we don't know whether we're going to get this 10 point 10 points back from you know this punishment from the Premier League but seven points now it is that's massive isn't it because obviously what what's happened over the past couple of weeks we picked 12 up out of you know five games but seven points clear just seems like a nice little little gap yeah it does when you think of the fixtures that Everton have had because I think after we always looked at December and were a little bit wary I think it's safe to say and then obviously the 10 point deduction hits Man United you know hits and you think all of a sudden Mm. December was very dark and you think a couple of bad results here to start with you know Forrest and Burnley for instance two allegation rivals you could be dropping points to you know squash them between Newcastle and Chelsea two tough games two teams who, who probably be pushing for European places but to come, you know, four straight victories is, is a remarkable return, and you know that cushion is there now. And you was like, you, you, I think the big thing as well is is that when you look at Saturday, I don't think you're that worried by Burnley. I think you know we all walked up to Burnley and thought these aren't great. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't think Sheffield United are great. You know, Luton I think are, are probably going to struggle a little bit as well. So all of a sudden you you got that seven point cushion. And you look at the opposition and think that they kind of need a massive turn around here to to get together a boost or to get a, a bump up. And like I say now, I don't think Everton and Aves are looking over the shoulder at all. I think they're, they're fairly looking above and at the top 10 and trying to get with the table as fast as they can. But the seven point is a nice comfort blanket because, you know, there's some tough games to come around as well. You know, Tottenham away, Man City at home, you know, two real tough games. And, you know, as much as you'd like to see Everton pick up points in them, if they don't, at least they know they've got a bit of a cushion from the, the hard the hard work that's, the hard work that's been done in the start of the month. It's... Um... It's mad to fate that we were born with that league going into that forest game. Yeah. Like that, 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 and you're you, you saying that what Connor's right there in regards to all the, the stats and, and how far we are, but like, like how, how easy would it have been for everyone's head to just sink after that? You know, after, after, you know, the fraud that built up to United, how, how up for every, it, how up for it everybody was that day. And then obviously it's just that, like the balloon of like indignation and positivity just punctured by that overhead kick. And all of a sudden it's like, oh God. Maybe ten points being knocked off is actually really quite bad for, for everyone here. Like and like that that realization sort of washed over me walking off the ground that day. And I think like and then obviously we had the bad results go against us that Saturday before the Forest yeah. game as well. And you're thinking, you know, it would have been really easy for everyone to just be like so down in the dumps and you know have a bit of bit of pity really when it didn't really have anything to do with this manager or, or this set of players. So to be bottom of the league going into that game and win, just string off four wins on the bounce. Well, conceding a goal, like it, it, it's such testament to, to, to this manager and the players that they've been able to just just get through that. And the other thing now is that we're dragging dragging other teams into you know we're we're, we're yeah. above Forest and we would have been above City. Uh, sorry, City, not City. <laughs> not doing that well. <laughs> <laughs> we would have been above Palace. Yeah, we would have been above Palace at the weekend if they if City hadn't flapped it against them in, in, in the last few minutes. And all of a sudden you look at like you know teams like Brentford and Bournemouth are still down there as well and like we're only three points behind a lot of them even with the 10 points off so we're bringing other teams back into it as well and it's just all giving us that that bit of extra cushion which is making us breathe a bit easier and means we can look ahead to games like Tuesday and think let's just go for it yeah. let's just go and try and win that that true I think the big really. thing as well with the points deduction is that it's now a case of if they got you know to say for instance they got five back you know but you look at it where that would take Everton in the table in terms of going up not looking at the same and think, well, if they get five back, at least that takes them fair bottom or it takes them outside. Yeah. You know, you look at looking at from a point of view of, well, if they get points back, it'll take them out of the relegation zone or it'll move them a bit close to safety. You look at it, I think, well, if they get five points back, we'll go to 10th or we'll go to 11th. And that's a big psychological thing. You know, you're not relying on them pushing to move you up the table in terms of fighting relegation. You're relying on them to probably bridge the gap between the, the top of the top half yeah. and middle bottom of the bottom half. Matt, I'll just come up to you on this one just before we briefly move on to Joe about Fulham. Um, are we in, I, I've refrained from saying this and asking the question because I know a lot of people have been talking about it, fans and pundits alike, but are we in danger of missing out on a European place? Well, yeah, at the moment. <laughs> you have to, have to say, wouldn't you? Like, it's, That's the frustrating thing around this. And, and, and you know, I'm sure you'll all agree. It, it does matter then when people go, oh, it's it's the best season to have this points deduction. Yeah. Like, <laughs> maybe, a few, maybe a few weeks ago, like I was sort of in agreement, but now it's like, well, no, it's not because look, we, we could yeah. be like proper pushing for... The top eight here, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it'd be like, you know, it'd be nice for Joe on a few European trips, oh, like seeing him go and cover final season. Go just oh, right, right, so that's it. Like, yeah. I mean, that, that is, the conversation starts to turn. Will this deduction deprive Goodison of European football in its final season? Oh, yeah. I guess we yeah, have to say that the fact that we're having that conversation it's just tests her into the way that the club are incredible. Uh, progress this year. I think there's two things that always need as well because the point deduction, but also them first five games of the season. 
you'd have just converted some of them yeah. chances against Fulham and yeah. Wolves then you could have been even rosier couldn't it I know I know you, you know you should get to carry the way you know you great for what we've done but you can't help but think in the first five games there's some there for Luton no so many there for the taking and we could have been even so much further better off and yeah, absolutely. So we'll do a brief full and preview. Then Joe, obviously, absolutely massive cup game, cup quarter final game under the lights at Goodison Park. Are you still going to be as confident while we're on here before you know before? The <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. What did you say that you said? Well, I mean, I was a little bit interested. <laughs> for, for, for the mic check. I don't quite think it's going to be like that. But I I just I can't I can't begin to fathom that Everton are going to lose three games to Fulham at Goodison Park in a calendar year and the two that have gone before have been so grim yeah so so grim mm -hmm. I'm like you know surely <laughs> like surely we can expect better this time round and obviously Everton are in a far better place than they have been any of the of those fixtures and Brownthwaite can come back in Gay can come back in potentially as well so there are more options with with Deitch for, for what you can do and, and I think that you know I asked Deitch about this on on, on Friday, it's quite interesting when you, one of the many disappointing side effects of the deduction was that all of a sudden you went from looking at this Fulham game with a lot of excitement to going, well, it's probably a cup game that we could do without him. It's what mm -hmm. looks like a very difficult December. It just sapped all the joy from it. But what Evans form since then is just, it's gone into, it's having to put themselves in a position where now they seven points, um, from the relegation so look head and shoulders above any side that's in there and some of the other sides in the league as well so all of a sudden you know you can treat this as a not a free hit but you can take it seriously this is a cup quarter final it's a cup quarter final against a team that everyone should be beaten at Goodison Park with a prospect of a non-premier league opposition in the semi-final to then get to Wembley like I mean you know go for it look how they're good enough like and then City so I go to, go to Spurs on, on Saturday and Spurs go for them uh, you know, the seventh side that know what it's doing on the road, and you know, Spurs has some fragility as well. All of a sudden, you can, you know, it felt like this at the end of Chelsea, only only after the relief of Dobbin's second goal. Certainly felt like this for most of the game at Burnley, but you know, all of a sudden, football at Everton has its fun back. I'm like, let's take advantage of this, let's just go for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think as well, and you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself, but the, the schedule of the cup. FA Cup game in Palace, although eyebrows have been raised, if Everton get through tomorrow night, that actually could work in Everton's favour because it'll give them longer to prepare for the, semi for the first leg of the semi final, mm -hmm. which I think is the following week. So that's a little bit of psychological. Connor's only booking his Wembley Hotel, isn't he? If I can check it out. I'll go at that far, but I'll just say me and Paul, we locked it down for a comic along them grounds last week where we probably got a bit too carried away. But <laughs> <laughs> I said, Paul, we locked it down for a conversation along them grounds last week where we probably got a bit too carried away. But <laughs> and Sadly, Sadly done nothing to stop me getting yeah. more, even more carried away. But yeah, I think and Joe was right, isn't it? I think it's a it's a it's a massive opportunity. Yeah. I don't get these opportunities, you know. If you look at Everton's kind of path to where they got to, they had to come over, you know. Me and Joe were at Doncaster, but it was it was far <laughs> from great for an hour. I don't think we ever thought we'd be in this position. If we did with Joe, I think I would be caught to be winning football Not matches. First off, I, think, <laughs> yeah. I think we said this in the worst we've had a season yeah. to play. So, yeah. so, so, so to get, I don't think we ever thought we'd get to a position where we wouldn't think quite comfortably so soon. Um, but this is a massive opportunity. You don't get many opportunities like this because you think of the cities, Liverpool, United States, Arsenal, Chelsea, all these big clubs you can normally come across either you know home or away. The way the, the path has opened up for Everton, it, it, it is a massive opportunity. This and what not? They should be doing all they can to take. A little bit of team selection. It's off. Then Connor stick with you for this one. Can you see Beto getting the start, or do you think he will stick with Dominic Carver Lewin? I think he'll stick with Dominic Carver Lewin. I think. Uh, I think he'll go as strong as he possibly can to right. I'll, given the teams he played so far, I would be shocked if he started to change things up now at this point in the competition and started making wholesale changes and, and, and stuff like that. I think the only way perhaps better one might get an odd over Dominic Calvert Lewis if Calvert Lewis we've got in fatigue and but the the games to come next week, but obviously it being kind of Tottenham City Wolves in a, a short space of time, whether Sean Dyche might think, you know what, we'll get better we'll run tonight and Seen have done for the weekend, but I just think that says the wrong message when you start doing stuff like that. I think you've got to play your strongest team from the offset and, and go with real purpose and real intention. Feels like better has got to start one of them though, doesn't it? <coughs> that four, four, four games. In, I think that's why yeah, I thought yeah. four games in like that yeah. short space of time, like that. You know, Don looks better. These looked really just physically, but like that that feels like a risk to me. So I wouldn't be surprised if better played on 
uh, Tuesday night, and that it was just like the rest of the team was just like your, your best eleven, mm-hmm. best eleven possible. So, but yeah, I, I, but again, I wouldn't be averse to even Don playing tomorrow and um, better start at the weekend because I get you know I, I'm so in on this this Carabao Cup. It's Tuesday, you know? it's, Fulham is more important than Tottenham. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah, it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fulham is more important than Tottenham. I gotta agree. Um, because you, you, just never managed in a quarter final. Oh really? No, no, he hasn't. No, yeah. Never managed a cup quarter final. That's you know. So I mean, like I think he'll take it seriously. Obviously, he got to FA Cup semi final with, with with Chesterfield, didn't he? But um, yeah, that's that's it. Like I, I think he's going to go all in tomorrow. Um, but he's definitely going to take it seriously. Obviously, yeah, fitness will will impact that, and that might have an impact on Dominic Carver Lewin. But yeah, I think he'll select the strong. I, I, he'll definitely select the side that he thinks is capable of winning. So, I think as well it's interesting with the League Cup isn't it because it's two semi-final players over two legs mm-hmm. and you think about oh, well Everton have done away from home this season and stuff like that you know it just, well, like, no, no it just stars align a little bit <laughs> like, so, like the FA Cup it's a one-off game at Wembley and you know it could go either way and you could be on the wrong end of a bad decision you got two games don't you it's the Carabao Cup to two bites of the cherry almost so and like you know one of the semi-finals has got Port Vale and Borough. Well, that's it. One of the so other one, one of the final. So there's potential yeah. for that. They've won Chelsea and Newcastle. You know, they've both just been sent packing by the, <laughs> the, the, the last few weeks. There you go. And they're like, obviously, Liverpool and the other one. But like, even, even if, I don't think they need to, you know, fancy play those really. You know, we went to Anfield earlier in the season and like, let's be honest, we got done by a bit of a shocking referee and this is not fade in. We really can hardly not get a sense of. See, it's Shell carried away with Britain. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like, I, I think. Like, so I think cup competitions are so much about momentum, aren't they? Mm. And like just getting momentum at the right time. And it feels like right now, like we, we're just riding that that wave of momentum. But I think if we get through tomorrow, I think it'll be a tricky game. I'm not sure it'll be six 0 <laughs> but I think again, I think just about uh, <laughs> I just about get through. But just got I think we just got to keep trying, you know, preserve this momentum for as long as we can because it, it is such a fragile thing in football. Like we're playing tough teams coming up. It, you know, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be a surprise if we got beat by one of them, and it was tough. And like you know, heads went down a little bit then. Like, but like right now, everyone's loving it. You know, we're all thinking about Wembley. We're all, we're all thinking about Europe. Like, just try and keep it going as much as possible. That's why I want to make two major changes for tomorrow. And I think it's why anyone if we've hosted got semi finals and got Everton, we're thinking they're good away from home. Goodison's a hard place to go now again. Don't fancy playing them. Match just staying with you then very quickly. Um, obviously, Keane and Godfrey, we've lavished praise on them throughout the the podcast, but you know, surely not enough. To, you know, Brantwaite surely going to be back in that team. Oh yeah, I think you know, I think he's all you've been player of the season, hasn't he? Probably yeah. along with with the core and Mikalenko. So I definitely get him back in there. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with this. Can Jimenez play tomorrow? Or I think he's going to suspend it off that straight. Yeah, way, I got. So he, I don't know. We will be playing up front for them. Um, but yeah, you, you definitely get him straight back into the side. I think he's, he's just been. As a good as allowed to earth the weekend, I think Brown Wade showed himself to be on a bit of a, a different level, hasn't he? And is an ideal partner for Tarkovsky. So, yeah, definitely back in the team for me. Before we get on to predictions, then, Joe, just some exciting news about Bramley Moore and the fact that Everton have confirmed that they're going to be moving into the stadium at the start of the 25 26 season. Um, just your thoughts on that, really, because I did see a couple of people have a little moan on social media that we're not moving in any sooner. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked too deeply into the finances of it, obviously, you know. The more games you have in the stadium where you can sell the more tickets for, the more money you're going to make. But to me, it feels like the sensible decision. Like the logistics of moving across the stadium halfway through the season, to me, they, they may be easy. Like I'm not speaking from a position of great knowledge here, but they just seem like chaos to me. That does. I think it's really important. That I think it's a good thing that Goodison potentially gets one final full year rather than kind of half a year. And you know, it, it just gives you. That opportunity to to completely bookend and celebrate the history of Goodison, and then have a full stop, and then have a summer looking forward to the new, the future, the new home. You know, so you you get to kind of have both celebrations, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it gives Goodison the send off that it rightly deserves, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it, you know, I think everyone's about the clarity, haven't they? Because it's been been a debate for a while about what they're going to do, whether they're going to go with season or stay, but. I think the right decision is being made. I also think as well, I think the club are saying that they'll get the keys in December of next year, isn't it? So you probably would have been in the test events with the last of January. Yeah. For handling how many they would have had to have done. You might be looking at March before they would have been able to play Premier League football, possibly. Be, I mean, I don't know that for definite, but you suspect there would have been a long pro- a process they would have had to follow. So I think rather than trying to rush it and do all that, just play the remainder of the campaign out to Goodison and move kind of on mass in... Uh, 
directing it to some of that. But uh, I think it's very exciting, isn't it? I think it's getting very, very real now. And I think it, it's it's a bit mad, I find, because on one hand, don't want to leave position and that's because someone who sits on a wooden seat and has an obstructive view to the park and go over <laughs> most weeks. But you don't want to leave it because of how you know, good it's been, how special it's been and stuff like that. But on the other hand, I think there's not one person who isn't excited to get to Bamley Moor Dock because it is a bright, you know, blue future, as you could say. And, you know, it'll help Everton get into the modern day world and be a football club and, you know, open so many avenues and channels. And it's one that, you know, hopefully it's a, a thing we'll never look back on. Some have appeared perfectly there, Annie. Yeah, well, I mean, I was just going to say, like, I'm like Joe, like, obviously, there are too much about like, the finances and stuff like that, and like what the cost would be and whether Everton will go lose money from this or not. But I think the, the one thing I would say is that, you know, Everton have done loads of stuff wrong, like, on and off the pitch in the past few years. The stadium stuff, by and large, has been handled absolutely spot on. And I think with that in mind, and like, somebody's probably like 50 50 on the decision. I'm just quite happy to just let the club deal with it and say, you know, well, you've got everything else pretty much spot on with this stadium ever since the concept first emerged. Um, I'm happy for you to just go with this decision as well, and I, I believe in them that this is going to be done properly. Um, of course, we need to find somewhere for the base statue to be built as well. After we, after we win the league. <laughs> and the most keen warrior, which, yeah, <laughs> which, which could take a bit of extra time. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Okay, predictions then, real predictions. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, go on, we'll go around the table. I hope you'll go seven now. Oh. Actually, actually, we're going to win seven. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think it'll be straightforward, um, but I think we'll just edge it two one. Okay. Yeah, I go two one as well. A bit of a change, that isn't it? Two one. Two nil. Two nil. And I said two nil as well, didn't I? Before that, so I'm going to stick with two nil. Okay. Looking forward to it. Cup quarter final. Fast for confidence, isn't it? Going to be, uh, uh, be chucking Carabao all day tomorrow. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, yeah. it's really yeah, chill. Semi final tickets for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, get them present requests in now. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Matt, Joe, Connor, thank you very much. This has been the Royal Blue Podcast. Uh,